people of God. This is the first week of a four-week sermon series that I'm going to do that's called, Are You Kidding? And the capital K-I-D in the word kidding to look at what it's like to have a childlike faith. We start this week with this lesson from Matthew that tells us that we must become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. It starts at the time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, don't we all always want to know who's the greatest? The greatest is anything. We have top 10 lists and the greatest athletes of a century. We have standings when it comes to sports. We even like to to joke with our siblings of who's the favorite child or grandchild in our family. We always want to know who's the greatest and who's number one. In fact, our entire political system is based on that. Campaigning, all you hear about is how I'm better than the other person. Never what's better for the whole. We are fascinated with knowing who's the best, and the disciples were no different. They always wanted to know who was the greatest. Which one of us do you love more, Jesus? The question comes in the gospel after Jesus had already told his disciples twice about the suffering and death that was going to await him in Jerusalem. After he has told them that following him entails denying themselves and taking up their cross. But it seems that Jesus' message was not really sinking in to the disciples. They heard about this kingdom of God coming, the heaven coming on earth, but they didn't really understand what it meant. For they were preoccupied with their status in this kingdom to come. In response, Jesus offers a profound critique in only the way that Jesus can. He calls a child forward, places them uh, among them, and tells them unless they change and become like that little child among them, they will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this had to be a shock to the disciples because they had given up everything to follow Jesus these years. They had had given up their lives. They thought, we're on the front end of this. We are going to get the best of the best. But Jesus rocked their world. And said, as long as they are concerned about their own status, they've missed out on everything that he'd been teaching them. The importance of having that child-like faith is important. Not because we need to just believe anything that comes our way, but there's an innocence to being a child, willing to engage and ask questions and, and learn, to listen to different things, to wonder why things are the way they are. And I came across a book that's called Children's Letters to God. An author put together different letters from children. Each week I'm going to read a few to you to kind of give you a sense of what a childlike faith might be. The first one in the book says, in Sunday school they told us what you do. What is it, who does it when you are on vacation? Signed, Jane. A letter from Charlene, it says, how did you know that you were God? This one says, Dear God, I read the Bible. What does begat mean? No one will tell me. Love, Allison. (laughs) Dear God, on Halloween, I'm going to wear a devil's costume. Is that all right with you, Marnie? (laughs) Dear God, are you really invisible, or is that just a trick, Lucy? Dear God, is it true my father won't get into heaven if he uses his bowling words in the house? Anita. (laughs) Dear God, did you mean for the giraffe to look like that or was it an accident? Norma. (laughs) Dear God, instead of letting people die and having to make new ones, why don't you just keep the ones you've got now? Jane. Dear God, who draws the lines around the countries? Nan. Dear God, do animals use you or is there somebody else for them? Nancy. Dear God, I went to this wedding, and they kissed right in the church. Is that okay? Neil. (laughs) Dear God, I like the Lord's Prayer best of all. Did you have to write it a lot, or did you get it right the first time? I have to write everything I write over again. (laughs) Lewis. 
God, it's okay that you made different religions, but don't you get mixed up sometimes, Arnold? Dear God, in the Bible's times, did they really talk that fancy, Jennifer? Dear God, I'd like to know why all the things you said are in red, Joanne. <laughs> Dear God, what does it mean that you are a jealous God? I thought you had everything, Jane. Dear God, is Reverend Co. a friend of yours, or do you just know him through business, Donnie? You can see the innocence and the questioning that happens with children as they think about God. They think about things more concretely than some of the theological concepts that I still haven't quite figured out since seminary. If you want to spend a whole day, we can try to hash out what the Trinity is and all of that, because I'm still figuring it out to this day. But these letters to God from children tell us that there is an awe in experiencing faith. There's an awe in reaching out to God. You see, a child in the ancient world was without status or rights, completely dependent on the goodwill of others to care for them. Jesus does not tell them that they should have a faith like a child, as if they could conjure up some kind of faith on their own, but they needed to become like little children. He further specifies what that means, saying, whoever humbles themselves like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It is giving up claims of power and status and knowing one total dependence on God that comes as the greatness in the kingdom of heaven. It's not about us building our own kingdom. It's not about us doing the right things or serving on all the right committees, but it's us humbling ourselves before God, being dependent on God for everything, just as a child is dependent on their family. But Jesus can't just leave it at that because that would make it too easy for us. He takes it a step further and says, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Jesus humbles himself in identifying with a little child, one without power and status. This is neither the first time nor the last time in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus will identify with those who are powerless, needy, and marginal. And he tells us that our response to people like that are our response to him. Jesus continues to talk about little ones, those without power or status in the community of faith. With shocking imagery, he goes to utter what the seriousness of the downfall could be of any of those who would, of these little ones who believe in me. He tells us that if we cause stumbling for those little ones, it's better if we would put a, a big millstone around our neck and drown in the depth of the sea. That's some pretty serious stuff where it's all fluffy and fun at the beginning when, when we talk about just being like a child, but then we're told if, if we go down the wrong path, we might as well put a millstone on our neck and throw ourselves over a cliff. And it gets even more shocking. Jesus starts out by talking about cutting off limbs and plucking out eyes. He says, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it away. It's better to enter life with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into the hellfire. Now, I, I don't know how you interpret that. Everybody hears things differently, but I get the impression Jesus is pretty serious about this stuff at this point. It's not parables and, and fun analogies. He's, he's been very literal here that you would be better off with half of your body than to cause stumbling among the least of these. If you get in and study the, the Hebrew and Greek and all the words that are used in the original languages, the word translated as hell here is Gehenna, which refers to a valley that is outside Jerusalem that was used as a garbage dump. There, the worms and the fire were continually fed by the refuse thrown out into the city, a vivid image for describing the destruction of evil around us. Jesus uses hyperbole to make a dramatic point. It's not only necessary to become a little one to enter the kingdom of heaven, but there's a dire warning for any of us who would lead little ones astray, who would prevent little ones from being a part of the community. You see, so often this scripture is used for a, a mission statement for children's ministry, to advocate for us to have a strong children's ministry. But it has so much more to speak to us as adults about how we're living our lives and engaging with our faith. 
That if we also don't humble ourselves as a child is humble, we are no better off in the kingdom of God. Throughout Matthew's gospel, Jesus places a special burden on those who are leaders in the community. Woe to those who said, instead of bracing little ones, cause them to stumble or lose their faith. Many scholars and commentators believe that Jesus was highlighting people's needs to understand the limits of their control. You see, control is a hard thing for us in our lives. We like to have it. We like to control every moment. We like to know what our schedule is. We like to, to affect the outcome of situations. But if you think about being a child, you really don't have a great amount of control in your life. We laugh, we run, we celebrate life, but ultimately we're controlled by the authority and the schedule of our parents and our family. Children don't have a lot of worries. Jesus is reminding his followers that God seeks to have a parental relationship with us. God is more than our Lord and our friend. God is our provider and our protector. Just as parents are called to be providers and protectors for their children. Control is so often a downfall and a dark place for us in our lives. We want to be in control. We want to dictate to people how things are going to work out. And we do that in our, in our lives, with our work and our families. It seeps over also into our faith life. We want things to be a certain way, or we don't feel that we're connected to God. But I'm going to let you in a little secret. We're not in control. We have no control over God. As much as we'd like to say that we do, as much as we feel like we do at times, God is in control of our lives, just as a parent is to a child. The sooner we recognize, the sooner we come to terms with it, the sooner, sooner we become okay with knowing that we are not in control the more amazing things that God can do in our lives can happen. God can move in our lives in ways we could, could never imagine if we are willing to give up that control and be like those little ones, to realize that it doesn't matter what our status or our privilege is, but that God is in control of it at all places at all times in everything that we do. He gives a warning to leaders, those with power, not just those who are formal leaders, but any of us who are adults have power over little ones. Those of us who have, have status and means have power over other ones. We're told that we have a special responsibility. And all too often the image of the church is one that doesn't come across very well when dealing with the least of these in our world. Many have been driven away by the church by their actions Churches are often judgmental then when people who fall away and come back. We also sometimes don't deal with children and young families so well as a church. We like to go to the old adage of children should be seen but not heard when it comes to church and worship. I'm going to tell you right now, as long as I'm here at the church, noise from children will never bother me. I will keep preaching over the top of it, I will keep praying, I will keep singing, it won't bother me. Because that sound is one of a church that is open, that is welcoming, that has created a place for children and families to be present, to not be judged. It's a sign of a healthy and a growing church. And I only have to look to a couple examples to see why that's important. We like to think it needs to be quiet and solemn at all times, but Jesus preached in noisy crowds all over the place, people heckling him and yelling at him, sometimes even throwing stuff at them. And John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, also did the same thing. He preached on street corners and in fields. Wherever he could find an audience, he was there sharing the gospel, no matter what was going on around him. We are called to be like children and also to welcome those who are like children. We, as followers, must allow for control to be in God's hands, to be cared for and protected by God through our relationship with Christ. It's a hard thing 
I'm the kind of person that doesn't like others to take care of me. I like to, to not ask for help and do those kind of things. So it's even hard in my faith life to admit that I need to turn it over to God. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one here today that feels that way. We're told to be self-sufficient, to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. But our faith life is not like that. We hear from Jesus in this gospel lesson and throughout this series that we've become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. May it be so. Amen.